Chris, who's going to um, tell us about the the looming budget scenario for fiscal year 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm going to take a seat. And, um, so what I want to do is kind of back up and give you the big picture, and then we'll. Um, and then we'll um, but actually, I have some handouts. There are four pages. I think there's more up here, and more we can call it if we need to. So I'm going to get there. They are too. But you can take those and hand those out. And I wanted to. Uh, those are stacked, so they're together. But you know, they're kind of in this weird stack. So you might want to start with those. Yeah. Um, so what I, I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about this year, but then I want to do a little bit of looking back over the last six years just to give you a sense of where we've been and how we're getting to where we are. Um, so, um, so you might need a few more. I wasn't sure how many to bring. A couple people can show me. There's more. more. There's more. I made 25, so. Then we're fine. <laughs> they, oh, they should collate to 40, yeah. So if you look at the last page first, I didn't really do them in the correct order. This is the fifth fiscal year 2011 major budget issues. So let's start on the revenue side. So starting on the last page, the page that looks like this. Okay. Look at the, starting at the top, our local receipts. We, so every year, as you know, we're allowed to go 2.5% from what we collected the year before. So the 2.5% of what we collected the year before this year is $895,877. That's 2.5% more than the levy was last year. In addition, I'm budgeting $500,000 worth of new growth. That means anything new built in the building, a new house, a new business, an, an addition to a house that ch changes its value. It doesn't mean uh, renovating your kitchen. It means that you've added an additional room to your house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to be, um, don't be turning in your neighbors for fixing the rec room. Okay, it's really about the big stuff. Um, so we're budgeting $500,000 there. Our historical average for a while was about $600,000. Uh, and we actually was high about seven seven fifty dollars in the 2007, 2006, 2008 range. Now we, then we saw it really plummeted at, because there was a recession obviously. And now it's starting to tick back up again. Actually, the state hospital is really helping us there, and we're seeing a little bit of other housing and other commercial development. Cole Morgan will come on fully in the next year. That'll help us. It's partially on now. There's some other uh, things that will come on. Uh, so the other local receipt is meals and rooms tax. We have, now we saw a big bump when that first came in, right? We adopted the meals and rooms tax, the increase a couple of years ago. But now it doesn't grow wildly. You know, we got the big bump when we first got it. Now we project about 2.5% going the going forward year. We'll see. It might be better. But, you know, the economy's been a little rocky, so we're not, we're, I'm trying not to be extravagant there on the pr projection. We have been taking $468,000 out of the landfill each year to, to help run the city. Because the landfill's closing, we're weaning ourselves off that. $468,000. So last year we took out $234,000 less, and this year we're, we're, we're going <coughs> to take the second piece out. So that's a ding on our revenue, not an addition to our revenue, right? That's a negative. State revenue is going to go down about $246,000. Um, that's a, mostly a cut in our, um, in our what's called our municipal, general municipal aid. Um, which used to be our lottery money in a category called assistance, additional assistance. They combined those two, and, and every year it's gone down since they combined it. It was going down before then, but it's continuing to go down. Um, and then finally, uh, Ed mentioned this, and I've added it in, which is the stimulus funding in the schools. I had a slightly different number because I've added a few other grants in there, but we're seeing one-time money going away on the school side with about 900 and something thousand dollars, close to a million dollars. So. Our net re growth revenue um, is, we're already negative in the revenue side, okay? Then you add in known expenditure increases, things we know are going to be, okay? Right now we have a bid in hand from our health insurance company for a 7.5% increase in our health insurance, or $719,000, to insure all of our current active employees, and we do insure retirees. Uh, they're all required to go on Medicare, and then we buy them a Medicare supplement plan. 
retirement, we have a known number. That number comes from the actuaries who work with our, with our retirement system. And then our other fringe benefits, this is Medicare, workers' comp, sick leave, buyback, et cetera. I have bumped that up 3%. I, it, we may not go up that much, but I want to be cautious there. City and school utilities, I'm assuming a 0% increase because we just did the, um, the ESCO project, which is the energy services contract where we are taking, we're investing $6.3 million in our schools and paying that back through the savings. And, and they're supposed to guarantee us a certain level of savings and guarantee us a, a flat cost for our utilities over the next 15 years, basically. So I'm not budgeting anything new for utilities. This is the first year we're not budgeting anything new for utilities. By the way, that may change a little bit depending on what I find out about rates. Okay, this is, they're guaranteeing us no new usage, but we still have to pay attention to rates. Okay. Uh, municipal insurances, vehicle, property, liability, all those kinds of insurances, a modest increase there. Um, and then state assessments. State assessments are the PBTA, the charter schools choice, uh, ch school choice. There's an air pollution district there. There's a whole bunch of large and small assessments. The net increase on those is $146,000 that we have to pay. And it actually gets taken out before the money even comes to us, but we do have to budget it. So our expenditure growth, just with the things I've mentioned, is $1.1 million. So you can see what the budgetary shortfall is there. Now that doesn't reflect any step increases, any pay increases, and any reflection of any additional needs, especially on the school side for things like special education, transportation, or any other non-personnel cost increases on the school side. So our, ne our, net, our problem is a $1.1 million problem right off the top. Now, if you add the steps, the steps will be about $450,000 in addition for school and city side. Just steps. Steps are, uh, depending on which unit it is, they range from 3% to 4.5%. Teachers have 4.5% steps. Everybody else is either 3 or 3 and a half. Public safety is 3, and I think everybody else is 3 and a half. Do you have a question? Yeah. So how come you're not included? Because I'm just trying to show the big picture right now. We have not we have a cap, we, we have some moving parts here. Um, we're in negotiations with most of our unions, so uh, right now I'm not putting anything in there for that. You know, we are going to have to cope with it, but what's the number I put on the table right now, given that we are still, we're still in discussion with our health insurance company, so I'm giving you the known number I have now. We don't have negotiated contracts for many, many of our units. We actually have one for police, but many of the other units don't have a contract yet for next year. Okay. Um, okay. Questions on this sheet? Is that pretty clear? I mean, it's not. I don't like it, but is it clear enough in terms of the way it's laid out? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, Very clear. So there's not a lot of places that we have control over this, by the way. Yeah. Why is the health care increase so high? Actually, in terms of the market, it's actually a pretty good increase. Really? I, mean, I, I look around the room. Anybody in the private sector want to comment on that? Yeah, it's our big, I, I have a law firm in Springfield, and it goes up 11, 12 percent a year. It's it's insane. Insane. <coughs> I mean, I, I see other people nodding. Mm -hmm. okay. 20? I mean, this actually, believe it or not, is a pretty good increase. I'm not thrilled with it by any means, but it's in terms of the great scheme of things, it's a good increase. We are still working with the insurance company to see if we can't drive that number down further. But under, a state, under the current way things work in Massachusetts, we first have to figure out what we're doing with our health insurance, and then we need to negotiate it with all of our 14 bargaining units and come to agreement with each of the bargaining units. And that includes not just on what their share of the premium is, but also what the plan design looks like. I, and I'm going to say very positively, positively for our unions, there's been a lot of cooperation in terms of getting to cost savings on plan design. In fact, last year, we saw a decrease in our health insurance because we made some very positive changes on the plan design side. So, I, I, you know, I'm optimistic we can get this number down, but there's no guarantee today. So I'm working on it. We're all working on it, including our employees. Other questions on this? So this is the nuts and bolts right now. 
The schools have, have populated their numbers. We kind of know what the gap is on the school side. We have all the department heads on my side have been asked to give me a level funded budget versus a level service budget. I said, tell me what you can do if I give you the exact same amount of money as you got last year. Schools did, what do you need to offer the exact same level of services last year? Okay, so we're going to be, on the city side, we're going to be integrating the money side and then we're going to have to save from there. Okay, one thing that I think we have to, we're working with the schools on is, how much do they own the stimulus problem internally just in the school department, or how much do we kind of spread that pain over the whole entire city, right, and try to make up some of that stimulus loss? That's a discussion we're having now as well, because it's not just, while the school department got that money, it, they, they got a cut in their state aid to fill, you know, there were there, there some strange ways that the state got them that money. We're trying to figure out how to share that pain and not make the schools only responsible for that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know, I'm st it's still early yet, that's why I'm being a little cagey because I don't know all the answers mm -hmm. to the questions mm -hmm. yet, but I'm giving you the, you know, did I put a date on the bottom? Yes, I did. Anytime I do mm -hmm. one of these, I put a date on the bottom. Tomorrow, it could look different, <laughs> because this is really a moving target. Things mm -hmm. change as we get, to, you know, as prices come in for certain things, uh, insurances, etc. As we work on the insurance issue, as we work with our, our labor unions to try to figure out what next year looks like, these could change. Okay. I wanted to just do a little bit of retrospective here, just as a way to think about this over time. And I, uh, Joel and I were just talking. We've had, he said, this has been bad since 2004. I said, actually, it's been pretty much bad since 2002, since just after 9-11. The only year I had in, in the office where we really saw a real increase in the budget was 2001. From then, we've seen either state aid cuts or local receipt drops. Between the two of them, we've seen some real, real, real problems. Even in the year that we passed the $2 million override, we made cuts that year, as you recall. It was a three-part strategy. Cuts, override, and, say, and, and consolidations. And that's how we got to, to, uh, to a balanced budget. Effort. But I just want to show you this chart, it, which is the bar graph, shows you what we've been spending in each year and then what's their relative percentage of the budget. And as you can see, schools are, are the biggest thing we spend money on, and they have stayed at 40%. That's the direct appropriation on education, plus the charter and choice and sped costs that we got get charged for us on the, on the cherry sheet from the state. The cherry sheet is our state aid sheet. So that's all of those numbers together. It does not include the cost of benefits to school employees. That's budgeted separately. But when you add the uh, when you add the benefits, schools, both Smith School and um, and the Northampton Public Schools are well over 50 percent of our budget. We spend more than half of our budget on schools. Um, the, oh, be, the other reason is because debt ser most a lot of our debt service goes to the schools as well. Um, the city's responsible for the capital management of the capital investment in those buildings. Not it doesn't come out of the school budget; it comes out of the city budget. So. Next big block in the building block, and we, one of our cost savings is that we don't use color ink. It would be much easier if I, <laughs> I don't have color ink. So. And Excel, you, know, you do different kind of patterns in the things, but they, gave, they took away that option. Bill Gates, I guess, didn't like it. So what you can see here is that that next biggest amount of money, and it starts at the bottom and works its way up, is employee benefits. Now, that's been true since 2004. You know, and it's a, it's a huge part of our budget. You know, we, we've gone from $10 million to $14 million in, in six years. So public safety is next. And I need to make a point here on public safety. Uh, these are actual year-end figures as opposed to budgeted figures. So in the first couple of years here, the police department was understaffed. And at the end of the year, they gave back money. And on the city side, we don't let the department spend their money. Uh, we take it back. On the school side, we let the schools keep their money. So city departments have to give us any unexpended money back, and that gets rolled into a cash reserve for the following mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. The schools get to keep their money and do whatever they're going to do with it. Okay. So in the first couple of years here, the police were understaffed, and they gave us money back. So you're going to see that they had a higher percentage change in the, out, in the, in the last part of the you're going to see that it looks like they grew more, but it's in fact because they gave more cash back in the beginning. 
Does that make sense to people? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, any questions on this one? This is really just kind of background information so you understand what we're doing, how we're getting there. The next one is, I just, this is kind of a good visual to let you know what's been going on here. <coughs> and, good question. That's public safety, that's police and fire combined. Police, fire, dispatch, there's a good question. Police, fire, dispatch, building inspector, and parking. And it also includes ambulance, but for the purpose of this, I backed ambulance out because it's totally self-funded. This is general fund expenditures. This is not the things that are self-funded, okay? Once we get ambulance fully up and running and able to fund itself, parking, we appropriate right at the beginning of the year and bring it into the general fund, but we don't do that with ambulance. So I took it out because it wasn't apples to apples if we left, left ambulance in. Yeah? What, what's included in employee benefits? Uh, health insurance, uh, workers' comp, um, pension for everybody but teachers who are covered on the state pension, mass teachers' retirement. Um, Police and fire workers' comp, which is different than regular workers' comp. Um, life insurance. Uh, we have a program called the sick leave buyback, which is uh, when pe if people leave, they get we buy a certain amount of their vacation, I mean, excuse me, their sick time back. It's capped at a number, of, I think it's $5,500. We have a few people who are grandfathered in under the old benefits, still the, the all new people are capped. And I think we went back to, um, sometime in the 90s and capped everybody going forward. So those are the major ca categories there. We also have a, a line item in there called, I, I don't remember the name of the line item, but it's a, where we keep money um, either if we, have, if we think we're going to be able to have a bargaining session with our unions, but the other thing we do there because we want, don't want to skew year-to-year -year numbers is we keep vacation time payout. So if somebody works to us for us till the end of the year, it quits and they get paid out, but we have to fill their position right away. It can skew your payroll by a month, per, let's say. Let's say they have four weeks of vacation you have to pay out, and you've hired somebody right away. It looks like you had 13 months in that, and then that positioned year. We're now paying that last vacation out of a different account in order to have accurate year-over-year -year information, which we didn't used to do. Okay, so those are the major things that are in that category. But by far, it's health insurance and pension. Okay, so the ins I, I, sh I showed you this year, the pension insurance is to, it increases $230,000. Okay, I, just a note on pension. There's been a lot of discussion across the country about public employee pensions and benefits. In Massachusetts, public employees are not on the Social Security system. This is the Social Security system for them. They don't have access to the Social Security system. That's not true in some other states, but it is true in Massachusetts. And we are on schedule to be fully funded for this pension system for our employees by 2028. Unlike the state of New Jersey or some other places that I can mention, we actually make our contribution every year. Okay, so we are on schedule to fully fund this pension. If you're on Social Security, you're not going to be fully funded by 2028. Okay, so we're... And if we put everybody on Social Security tomorrow, it would cost us pretty darn close to what we're paying now. Hmm. Okay? There, it's not extremely more generous. It might be slightly more generous now. Not, not generous, more expensive. It might be slightly more expensive now, but it's in order to get to that payoff in 2028 where it levels off. Okay? Now, the other thing we do is retiree health insurance. That's not funded. We, the city is going to have to figure out a way to start funding that into the future, just like every other state and local government is going to have to figure out. Okay, but just when you're hearing these discussions about pension, remember in Massachusetts, this is Social Security for people. And if you collect Social Security, and I, I think, John, you're on a, are you on a state pension? What happens if you collect Social Security and, and that pension? Don't you get dinged? Uh, there is a reduction. Actually, I'm not on a state pension. You're not, you're not. Uh, but weren't you at Westfield State? You didn't take the pension there? I did teach briefly part-time at Westfield oh, okay. State. Oh, okay. All right. I was at Westfield England College. That's right. You were at Winnick. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but I think the way it works is that you get dinged if you take mm -hmm. the um, Social Security, you get dinged out of your mm -hmm. pension. So it's mm -hmm. not a... Yeah. There's yeah. a reduction for the whole thing. I don't think it's, a, it's complete, but... No, no, but there is a reduction. It's large, yeah. Right. Yeah. So... Just keep that in mind when you hear this kind of discussion about, and our average pension check, the average is $19,000. Okay. 
for our for our retirees, number one. And when Thank you look you. at their education level, you know, that's not out of line. Number two, the COLA for our retirees is only on the first twelve thousand dollars. So they don't get a COLA for any of the dollars mm -hmm. above twelve thousand mm dollars. -hmm. And the maximum COLA I think they're allowed to get is three percent, which is three hundred and sixty dollars a year. Okay, so that just to put that into some kind of perspective, it's not quite the gravy train that sometimes it's made out to be. And we do have a few people who are like, I think, 117, who are still in our very old pension <laughs> system, who are getting very small checks, and we pay 100% of that. But most of our people pay in, um, well, teachers either pay 9 or 11% of their salary, which is more than Social Security, and uh, non-teachers pay, I think it's uh, 9%. So just to put it in some perspective. Okay, so when you look at this chart, you know, there's a couple things that jump off the page, right? These, again, year-end numbers. So the first one, 182% is human services. That's all veterans' benefits. We are required by the state to pay veterans' benefits, what are called um, 115 benefits. If you're a veteran, you get a benefit from us if you are income eligible. We pay you. Uh, a check. It's like um, uh, uh, you know, income support. As a, a vet, if you're struggling, we give you money. That's the a change in the law that just happened a couple of years ago, which is why it was no, wrong. No, no, no. I'll, I'll get to it. But you're they're partially right. But um, we, when I started, we were spending about forty thousand dollars a year on veterans benefits. We will spend about six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars this year on veterans benefits. Now we're reimbursed in in the year, following year, year and a half, on our next cherry sheet. But, but you still have to have the cash up front. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we can get yeah. the reimbursement, but I have to have the money to pay it first, right? So it's gone up for a couple reasons. One is there are two wars on, and there's a lot of people coming home who need some help. That's really a very important piece. Mm -hmm. Number two, there's a lot of aging Vietnam veterans who are now needing services. Um, and number three, there was a change in the law that allowed some peacetime veterans to now qualify. So those three things combined with the fact that we are have a VA in our community, there's a homeless shelter at the VA hospital, means that our number has really skyrocketed. And we have the highest veteran benefit costs per capita, capita in the state. It means we're treating our, benef our, our veterans the right way, but it's killing us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't surprised to hear you say that. Uh, in one of the causes for the increase is the current wars we have. Are we going to be paying those benefits for the lifetime of those veterans? It really, no, it, it really okay. isn't. There are some um, pensioners, if you want to call them that, uh, elders that have, who, who this is one of the pieces of their, that they put together for their income, income support. The younger folks, uh, we have a great veterans agent, a guy named Steve Connor, who works very closely with vets, um, with, uh, with and his goal is to help get them hooked up with the right services to, to move them off the benefits, and he's done a very, very good job of that. He works, yeah, John knows him, he's done a really <coughs> good job, but he also works very closely with the VA, so that if somebody we have currently on our benefits actually is entitled to some enhanced benefits from the Veterans Administration, he'll help move them on to those benefits. And sometimes we actually get paid back. So, like, let me give you, Steve came in to me a couple years ago and he said, I have this guy, it's risky, I'm going to give him the benefit. I don't know if we're going to get approved by the state for this guy, but he's going to pay me back. He said, but I want you to approve it. And I said, okay, I'll approve it, because I trust you. Six months later, he comes in and he said, here's the check. So he took a risk on this guy, the guy needed some help with housing. He gave him the, the benefit for four or five months. The guy ended up going on to a, another, I think he got Social Security Disability. He paid Steve back. So I gotta say, it was a really Steve's really good with those vets. Yeah. Is that a means-tested program? It is a means-tested program. Actually, when and I, this may be this is the way I understand it. I'm not sure I'm totally right about this, but um, when welfare went to the state, which was in the '60s, the veterans basically said, "We don't we don't want to be considered a welfare program. We want to stay in the local governments." And so the veterans portion of that means-tested help stayed in local government. So that's the highest one. Next highest one is employee benefits, went up 37% in the last um, 
six years. Now, if we had gone up the way your health insurance has gone up, it would have been a lot higher. We had one year of zero increase. We've had, you know, we've had other years when we've stayed below what the state average is. So we've done relatively well. It's about six percent a year. That's actually better than a lot of places. But it's still high when you think about the fact that in the previous page, what you saw our number is for health insurance. You know, we spend a lot of money on health insurance. So six percent is high. Right. Miscellaneous is mostly insurances, and it's a small number, it's just a high percentage. Um, the public safety, I mentioned to you why that's a little higher. That's because at the beginning of those years, we, uh, the chief the, uh, had money left over in his budget, and then it picked up at the end of that time. I also want to mention that we don't fully fund the fire department for their overtime. We know that they're going to run over, and we don't fully fund them. And we true that up at the end of the year. Because you might have a year that you don't need very much, and you might have another year that you need a lot. If you budget a lot, then you don't have that available for somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So we true it up at the end of the year. Um, so that's reflected in there, too. Remember, these are actual end of the years, not projected. Um, education. Public works is going up only 16%. That includes all of their snow and ice, by the way. Okay, so this is at the end of the year, after they plowed, after we've trued up their budget, this is what they have. Did you have insurance? We didn't. We had insurance that we didn't, we wouldn't have gotten it paid out in any of those years. And, and, and we've dropped the insurance because you know finally the insurance company figured out that you know you have to get 68 inches and then the premium is 50 you know 45 or 50 thousand dollars. So you don't really start getting money from them until you hit 75 inches. I prefer to take the forty-five thousand dollars and put some more people on plows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, at this point, plus so, they measured in Amherst, and they started measuring in Amherst. Now, what we used to do—I'm not sure—I want the camera to pick this up. But what we used to do is have a picnic table on the back of the DPW yard and it was measured there. So, and I—I I think they might have swept the table clean every two hours yeah. and then re-measured. So I'm not sure it was as packed as it might have been in Amherst. Now, what's interesting here is culture and recreation went down. We went up on the libraries, but what we've done is shifted even more of the cost of rec programs into the revolving funds there and off the appropriation. We used to pay more of the salaries of the rec people. Now they're being paid more by the fees of the rec users. Um, and then you can see that the other ones went down. Debt service went down a little bit. You're going to see debt service varying because of the overrides coming mm -hmm. on and off. So you're going to see that number changing. And it'll go back up because of the police department, but then it'll go back down again. So that was just kind of a way to think about real. This is kind of the graphic picture of what our problem is. <laughs> right? This was, I wanted to look at, um, you know, people say, well, you, you're spending too much money on people. You're giving people extravagant raises or, you're, you know, whatever. So I took, there's three categories in the, in the municipal budgeting. There's personal services, which is people, right? It's it's overtime and it's straight time, people. Second is ordinary maintenance, which is not people. Okay, it's sand, it's stationary, it's light bills, it's the, the fuel, it's fuel, it's the insurance contract, it's everything that's not people. And then other than ordinary maintenance uh, is I, I put debt service in there, and I spelled ordinary wrong, wrong too there, but. Um, <laughs> I put debt service in there. It's not really, it's really categorized differently, but just to show where our debt has been, okay? So if you look at that, you can see that percentage growth a year per year in our payroll has only been about 2.6%, which is pretty darn good. Remember what I told you the steps were before. Okay, other than ordinary maintenance, about 4.9%. That's health insurance, that's veterans benefits, and that's fuel, including gasoline and, um, electricity, gas, etc. And then you can see what's going on with debt service. So with that, I just wanted to lay out some of those numbers so people could see a little bit of the big picture at the same time. There's a lot of discussion happening in the national media about state and local finances, and I thought it might be good to have a little snapshot about what the trends are right here. And we're back to the major budget issues again. And questions, thoughts? This is why I love my job so much. <laughs> There's like a moment of silence here. I was resisting like, an opportunity to teach you about not continuing your job. How are you going to help the next guy? Uh, 
and I'm going to try to put together a budget for this year that's going to be balanced and as responsible as I possibly can make it. That's my obligation. I'm going to do that. To pass to the next mayor? Well, you know, we mayors come in in January. There's another half year of the fiscal year before you know, mm -hmm. we do another budget. We're going to try to put together a responsible budget. And uh, my goals have always, to the extent I possibly can, has been to protect public safety and education. And I'm going to continue to try to do that. But it's very difficult. You know, we, uh, you read in the paper the concerns of downtown business people around public safety, whether real or perceived. Those are issues, you know, that we've had the break-ins in in, around the city. Um, there are some public safety issues that we just need to deal with. And we are right now, we just added nine police officers, which have been budgeted for. Mm -hmm. But it's been really hard to fill those positions, partly because the state police pay so well. and they're by the way, going to have a class pretty soon, so I think we're going to end up with vacancies. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to stay competitive on that side. Um, on the fire side, the ambulance really has been a lifesaver because we've shifted some cost of running the fire department over to the ambulance budget, but that's not going to grow forever. This is our full year, and we think we're going to see the extent of the growth there. Uh, it's fully, and it really is fully self-supporting, and I'm very proud of that. Our, our, our people have put together a program that has increased public safety in the city, and it's paying for itself. Yeah. Even, even to the extent of budgeting for the capital replacement? Yeah. Pays for its own capital. Pays for all the supplies. It pays for all the fuel. It pays for overtime for anybody who's called back to go onto a vehicle uh, if, there's, if we need to call people back. And it also pays for, I think right now, nine people out of, out of that budget as well. Yeah. So, um, the, the budget you have here, the, the major budget issues, does that include all the cuts coming from the state? Yes. Okay. That's first. But the second question is, um, so over the past few years we've had the stimulus, we had the override, um, and then local meals tax, etc. So where's, in terms of the things we can control, oh, it seems like the things we control are really about personnel. Is that really that's where it's right. at? That's, so that, that's where it's at. That when you think of the big thing this year that could come in to help, is that well, what, I mean, the, the legislature could say, we're going to give you more money. You know, <laughs> they could say that. I mean, I think there may be some impetus for them to do something on the education side because they know we're all losing that stimulus money. Mm -hmm. They might want to do that. I've heard, I've talked to, you know, Pete Cocott, and he says I, that they're concerned. That doesn't mean that they're going to get to yes on that. Mm -hmm. They have a big problem themselves. Mm -hmm. They lost mm -hmm. a lot of stimulus money. Their health care costs are going up at... at we're doing better than the state in some in some respects on the on the healthcare. You know, when you look at the Medicare and Medicaid numbers that are yeah, Medicare and Medicaid numbers that they have, they're going up. So they have a real problem. And uh, but they could give us a little bit more money. But I think in terms of what we have to control, health insurance, it's fees, which we haven't looked at yet this year, and we will be looking at, and it's um it, it's uh, payroll growth either through adding or subtracting people and or by a collective bargaining. I mean, you know, something like 70% of the budget is people. You know, and I haven't done that chart yet, but I, I will. Because, <laughs> you know, since I can't control any of it, I just chart it. <laughs> Excel makes me feel powerful. Um, I mean, we, we, you know, but when you look at it, that's what we spend our money on as people. We're in the people business. You know, we deliver services, and you need people to do that. You know, we, are, we do have a capital plan, and I, I want to just mention this. Sometimes people say, well, if you don't have any money, why are you doing X, Y, or Z? So let's talk about X, Y, and Z, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's important to understand that there are pockets of money that we can spend on some things, and we can't spend on other things, okay? Mm -hmm. so. We can't pa spend Community Preservation Act money on teachers. We can't spend water enterprise fund money on the fire department. You know, it's, it, these monies are earmarked for specific uses and we're not allowed to spend them on other things. So when we bought watershed land up in Waitley to protect the watershed for the citizens of Northampton, we bought that out of the water enterprise fund. And the state paid for half of it approximately. And we. We could not buy the land, but it doesn't mean we could take that money and spend it on the schools. Now, I'm just going to say that we, in 1871, the, um, our forefathers, and I'll say fathers because I don't think there were too many mothers at that time making these decisions, 
went to the legislature and said, we want to have the authority to protect the watersheds for the citizens of Northampton, and they gave us, the, the water commissioners, the responsibility and the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. And actually, in 1901, they gave us power of eminent domain in the towns of Waitley, Col Colrain, Williamsburg, and a few other places mm -hmm. to take land to protect our watershed. So we don't tend to take it. We like to have a nice conversation with people because, as you know, eminent domain gets people a little riled. Mm. <laughs> but in the scenario where we, if we had wanted to take that land in, in Waitley, there was an appraisal that gave a certain price. If we went to court, the judge would have said, you're paying the price of the appraisal. So we bought it for the appraised price, slightly more, because we pay, pay for some timber value, but nothing dramatic. That's permanently preserved, forever. It's for your great-grandchildren to be able to drink water in the city of Northampton. I think it's a good expenditure. But even if it was the stupidest thing we ever did, I can't take that money and spend it on the things we, you know, I can't fill this hole with it, right? People are upset about the idea that we might put a little park, pocket park in front of City Hall. Well, as somebody who crosses that crosswalk, I'd love for that crosswalk to be less narrow and that corner to be mm -hmm. more well-defined, which is the goal there. Mm -hmm. We're going to end up with a little space there. We could either pave it or put grass there. If you put grass, it's a park. Why not do that? <laughs> Nobody's, if we don't do it with CPA mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. we can't take the CPA money and do something else with it. So it's just important mm -hmm. for people to remember mm -hmm. that. And nobody's trying to pull a fast mm -hmm. one here. Right? It's just, you know, we're trying to... We're trying to figure out a lot of different things at the same time. At the same time we have to run this yearly budget, we also have to invest for the future. Watershed lands an investment for the future. Would another example be like when we had the parking expenditures and um, a piece of equipment wanted to be bought? Yeah. And, and did that fall along the same lines? Well, let me take the question of equipment in general. We have a capital plan. We plan on what we're going to spend for our capital improvements for the whole city, from roads to buildings to you name it. And we have a an ongoing capital planning process. There's um, a, a citizens and department folks and board representatives on our capital. Are you, are you on capital improvements? But Ed's on this year because he's chair of budget property on the school side. Have you been to your first meeting yet and seen, seen the awesome list of things that we need to do? We've tried to create a capital improvements program that says what do we need to invest in the future and what, what are the things we need to invest in. So, and when I, you know, we're living off the fumes of the capital improvements that people did 50 or 60 years ago when you look at our roads. I mean, mm. and, and, the, and the drainage systems and the, you name it. That we're, you know, and our parents and grandparents made those investments for us, and what's our obligation on a going forward basis to the next generation? We're trying to figure that out. Every year, we do a capital investment program. We, uh, we spend about $6 million. A lot of that is funded. Okay, and that means it's got other revenues coming in to pay for it. You know, the parking system pays for its own capital improvements. The water system, the sewer system pay for their own capital improvements. Um, we spend about 2.2% of the general fund on, on, on debt service. And we're trying to grow it by one or two tenths of a percent a year so that we can eventually get to all the things we need to do. We have $28 million of road work that, I think that's right, David, does that seem right? $28 million worth of road Sounds work right. that needs to be done in the city. <laughs> We're trying to get to the place where maybe we could spend a million dollars a year on roads. We have equipment needs. Our, some of the trucks up at the DPW are, I feel like I'm in like a farm in upstate New York where there's truck bottles littered all over the place, you know, because they, they keep taking something from one and putting it on the other one, making them work. But we need some new equipment there. And uh, we proposed buying a smaller backhoe that people didn't like that idea. We didn't buy it. We ordered the newer backhoe. Both backhoes broke, both the current backhoes broke down and were not available during for part of this plowing season. I wish we had bought the smaller backhoe because we have parking mm -hmm. spaces that were full mm -hmm. for a long time during this storm which meant that we lost revenue the day we were filled with, storm, with the snow. So, but that's water over the dam, which is a whole other discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we need to invest some money every year in equipment. Fire trucks. We just had a fire truck pump blow up. If you have a fire, you need it to be able to shoot the wet stuff at the red stuff, as they say, right? The pump blows up, you can't shoot the water. You know what a pumper costs? 
Right. And it's like, it's not like you can go to the other pumper company. They all cost $600,000. So mm -hmm. we don't have enough money to pay, buy a pumper. So we're gonna we're buying a used pumper from a city, a town in upstate New York that um, doesn't have nearly as many fires as we do. So the truck is in really good shape, and we're gonna keep it on the road for the next five or six years till we can afford to buy a truck. Because mm -hmm. we need to have a pumper truck. Because mm -hmm. when you're in your house and it's on fire, you expect us to show up mm -hmm. and shoot water at it. <laughs> so that's what we need to do. So it's all those kinds of things, try and put them together in the capital plan. And Ed and his colleagues are going to try to sort out, of all those things, what are the ones we're going to do this year? Other thoughts, questions? Tomatoes to be thrown? This out. Lisa and I worked together many years ago in Chuck. It's just the same, Lisa. It's just more zeros at the end of it. <laughs> so this is really bringing back memories. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I need to excuse myself. Thank you. Nice to see you. Can you um, help me understand better? Like, uh, you always go into deficit spending with snow and ice removal, and there was a lot of money expended there this year. You had about a $250,000 bill to clear roofs of buildings throughout the city. Now, you come up with a, with a budget number. Is those expenditures included in there somehow? No. So, what happens is that at the end of every year, we true up the books, and, the, and then we know what our excess cash or lack of cash is. And if we have more cash, you know, if receipts were higher, if our spending was lower at the end of the year, we have a fund balance that in municipal budgeting is called the free cash, which is a really bad name for it. <laughs> but it's called the free cash. So we, we um, so this year we were certified at about $1 million worth of free cash. And we use the free cash to backfill when we're over in certain things. So this year we have more overages than we have at free, as in free cash. So we're going to be looking at other funding sources for some of the overages. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars at least in snow and ice. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars in roof clearing. And by the way, we're doing the roof clearing for all the buildings, both city and school, but it's not coming out of the school budget. It's going to come out of the city's budget. Um, even though the schools are technically responsible for their buildings maintenance, we're not. I mean, that we're not going to tell them come up with two hundred thousand dollars in the middle of the year because they don't have any way to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to figure that out. Uh, we have some fire overtime, which we're sorting out how we're going to pay that, and we have um, veteran services, veteran benefits. We're going to need another two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that. So right now, Chris Pyle, the finance director, and I are figuring out how we're going to pay those bills by the end. Snow and ice is the only thing you're actually allowed to carry forward and fund in the next year. You can, you can budget it into the next year, but that just, you know, carries your problem into the next year. So we're not going to do that. We're going to try to figure it out. So the way we do that is through free cash. Now what the school system has done, the school committee has done, is keeps the school choice money in a sort of a similar way. It keeps the money against, uh, as a hedge against problems during the course of the year. We keep the free cash as a hedge against those problems in the course of the year. So the way the free cash gets developed is, remember I said the police chief gave some money back? Everybody who gives money back, that ends up in the free cash for the following year. If our receipts are higher than we projected, so this year excise receipts are a little higher than we projected, that'll show up next year. We don't get to use them in the year we accrue and we have to wait till the following year. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. You're getting municipal finance, you know. 101. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Liz already done this once, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, any, any other thoughts? I mean, we're going to, it's a work in progress. I'm going to be doing the same kind of update at the city council meeting, so stay <coughs> tuned. Yeah. And this may not be a super fair question, but if you were imagining the day after you solve this problem, what do you think kind of the contours of that solution will look like? Um, I I, I, it's not, to, I'm not sure totally. I do think it means that we have to do better on health insurance and that we're going to have some tough bargaining. I think those are the two areas that, you're going to, that are going to be difficult this year. We, I think we've squeezed an enormous amount of economy out of every place else, you know. If you, if, and if you look, for instance, at general government, which is all of these offices, everybody here that does everything from collecting your taxes, assessing your taxes, all those people, 
about 15% over the last six years. It's a, a tiny increase. There's nothing more really to take out of there, right? So if you look, you know, I could squeeze on the police and fire side, but there's certain stuff that really keeps me up at night, and that would be the kind of thing that would keep me up at night. So, and the schools, you know, that, that also keeps me up at night. So we're gonna, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be a tough question now. It's not Northampton's problem alone. Everybody's having the same kind of discussions. If you look mm -hmm. around us, everybody's mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. the same kinds of discussions. It's not unique to Northampton. So, you know, people will say, well, you spent that for blah, 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 blah. You know what? Didn't really make a difference. You know, this is, that's why I wanted to give you the big picture of numbers, because I think they tell the big picture problem. Do you want me to pass out the razor blades? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was totally wrong. <laughs> um, so you said that you're going to be, you know, kind of talking over a lot of these same um, numbers with the city council. But because this is a ward meeting, what do you see as how to go from talking about how this affects the whole state to really super local? Okay. Sort of for our part of the city. Where, how do you see that connection? Like, so for example, if Ward Four is a part of the city where we have some businesses, how could Ward Four think about encouraging growth, such as by addressing local business owners' concerns about safety due to break-ins? Or you know, like there's some. I feel like there's some connection there with well, our actual. I think. You know, yeah, it's a really good question. Thanks for asking it. I think some of the you know, in terms of the hyper-local stuff. I think a lot of the business owners downtown are hoping that people will shop in their shops. Yeah. I think they sometimes yeah. feel neglected by local people, and so that's one very simple thing. Yeah. I do think it's important for people to remember that some of the things that they really, really want we might not be able to get to. So that, um, let me, I had somebody call me the day of the ice storm and say there's ice on the road. Yeah. And I said, yeah, there's ice on the road. <laughs> You know, it, it's got to be an understanding that this is a human enterprise mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. it takes people a little bit to get to mm -hmm. the 170 road miles. So people can give that kind of, you know, understanding to the people who are doing the work that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's helpful is to help your neighbor out, you know, to go out and if you're, you know your neighbor can't shovel out the driveway and you know our plows have to go down that street and we don't really have a choice to but to plow it in. If you can help shovel it out, it makes mm -hmm. a difference. And it, you know, it's not something, it costs us any money, but it makes for better community relations. I noticed the group that's shoveling the bike path. Good for mm -hmm. them. We, mm -hmm. we are trying to shovel as many as we can, but we are short on resources mm -hmm. to do that. We use a truck called a Bombardier to, to a crazy name for a, it's like a little sidewalk pile. But it broke down. So we need to get it fixed. And so there's people out doing that, and that's great. That kind of stuff is very, very helpful. Um, in terms of revenue next year, I think, well, I mean, you could go out to eat more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best <laughs> to increase that revenue source. Or you could go stay in the hotel no damn. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's local revenues, yeah. it's really yeah. a tough one. It really is a tough one. And, um, you know, we have a mixed relationship with growth. People don't want growth. Mm -hmm. But growth is an, an integral part of what makes our budget work. So, you know, I hope everybody here joins the discussions about how to make growth work for us as a community. All right, what works? What's the kind of growth that works? But remember, a million dollars, I think this is right, a million dollars gets us $12,890 in new taxes. So you have to have an awful lot of new growth to close the gap, right? So it's a combination of new growth, of us working smarter, of us supporting local businesses so that they can grow, you know, all those things together. And I know that Joel is going to talk later about what the other things are on a more statewide level. But, um, you know, because we can't solve it alone. We have a capped local revenue source. You know, we can't go above the two and a half. We are capped in most of our other revenue sources as well. So. I did say we will be looking at fees. We look at them every year, but you can only go up by the amount that the, the service actually costs you to offer. So we can't 
Let me give you. So we you can't, can't charge us five hundred dollars a piece for trash. Well, let me give you an example. No, no, actually, trash is, is you can you can charge the cost of trash. Yeah. But let me give you an example. Birth certificates. We have a hospital in town. Kind of have you know kind of the market. Um, but you know you have to, you can only charge as much as it costs for the clerk to issue the birth certificate. So, which is reasonable. Yeah. I'm not arguing right. with it. I'm just, yeah. you know, sometimes people think our fees might be unreasonable. We really have to, we really do watch what, how much they cost. Yeah? Um, a property like where Price Chopper used to yeah. be, is that, is that, is there some kind of a legal problem with that? Or what has happened to this? Has the city tried to do something to try to get something going? I mean, it's just, it's a city there. It's been there for years. I you agree know. with you. So <laughs> let me talk about that one. Because, and I'm glad to bring it up because it's an important part of the discussion. It was owned by a gentleman for many, many years who didn't want to sell it. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted to get his price for it, and his price was not what the market was. Mm -hmm. So he didn't sell it. And he didn't sell it for many years. And I had a long-distance telephone conversation where I would remind him that it was important for us that he sell it. But he didn't want to sell mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. He... Um, he, he went as far as even having a developer in, come in and do some preliminary permitting, and then he decided that he couldn't meet the, the price necessary to make the project work. So he finally sold it. And there's a new company that owns it. Two years ago, they came in and permitted this traffic light that's necessary to, to use that. Two years ago, nobody was signing long-term leases to do anything. So they kind of slowed down, right? You know, two years ago was when everything was really falling apart or beginning to fall apart. They're now again looking at what they need to do. They need to um, finish the traffic permitting and then start the permitting of the planning board, and I think they're in the process of doing that. You know, those lots are tricky, though. They're not very deep. If you go to those mm -hmm. lots, it's not... You know, when you go to Hadley and you're driving out and you look at those lots in the mall, they're very, very deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. This mm -hmm. is a very shallow lot. It's got the railroad mm -hmm. track right there, and on the other side, the lots are relatively shallow, shallow because it goes right up, starts going up the hill. So our King Street has that highway business feel, but it, it's not like uh, Russell Street. In, in, or in, mm -hmm. in, it's very different in terms of the, the uh, physical layout of King Street. Part of uh, what the planning board now is looking at is can we change the zoning on King Street to, a, to make, it even, make it more likely that some things would happen there. Uh, I've been frustrated, as everyone else has, and I often hear the city did or the city should or the city could. Ultimately, it's a private owner's property, and they have to make a decision about what they're willing to do or not do, or whether they're willing to sell or not sell. Same thing is true for the Honda lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if they still own those lots, like the Honda lot, aren't they responsible for keeping up the property? They are not. If they, they own it? They're not. We don't have we're a, responsible for our green space between the road and the... Sidewalk, well, but we, they are not. Well, they're not. They, they are responsible to shovel, and 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 they are, and sometimes they don't. We well, find, and we find them. I think they might be. We find people for not doing what they're supposed to. do. They're certainly not responsible to take care of their buildings, though. They can do whatever they want. But the buildings can fall down. Isn't that a public health issue? If it becomes, a, 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 you know, we just had a little lesson on this in my neighborhood at Laurel Park when a house <laughs> fell down. Yeah. The city can order a house to be torn down, and if the person doesn't pay for it, we pay for it to put a lien on the property. Mm -hmm. But um, as long as it's not considered a danger, and that's up to the building inspector to decide. It, that can be unsightly. It can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is. <laughs> yes. It can be unsightly, but as long as it's not dangerous. If, it, if it's dangerous and there are some... If you see a building in town with an orange X on it, it means that the fire department's made a determination that they're not going to go in there if there's a fire. Mm. But if you recall, the state hospital was filled with buildings that were falling down. You know, we put mm. orange X's on a lot of them. Mm. And finally, they tore down the ones that were the most scary, quite frankly. But they're not quite so prominent. You know what? I was more worried about them than any of the building on King Street. You know, I really was. People were in those buildings all the time. I was really worried about those buildings. Mm -hmm. it, I really was. King Street worried me less. In the old days, South Street School actually used to be the place to go break in. <laughs> Before it was the music. Some people might remember that. I remember when it was when it closed and kids would go in there. Wow. They had the haunted house there, mm -hmm. and then the kids would go break in and run around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> A few kids got arrested for going in there. And, yeah, yeah. So, any other thoughts? Here I am.
tripping down memory lane, where, uh, <laughs> to totally depress you, and then I go off on tangent. Yeah, we've actually yeah. heard from the developer on the on the price chopper lot, so that's already been through. The oh, good board. through planning board. Good. Oh, that's okay. So they did do and that. They're actually talking about putting another little front business, like a drive-through bank, and in, in that. And it's got some interesting pieces to it to try mm -hmm. to protect the traffic on King Street mm -hmm. by making those lots communicate offline. Yeah. That way. Um, but another thing you mentioned, King Street, next week you have um, uh, Nelson Nygaard in. It'll be, this, is, this is just an announcement. Um, next Tuesday night from 7 to 9 at the Senior Center, they're going to be discussing traffic and, and uh, pedestrian and bicycle issues in town for King Street and downtown. And the engineering firm that did the Smith College project is coming to talk to us about mm -hmm. some ideas. And that's being paid for, by the way. When we did the zoning up at the state hospital to allow for a little bit more density up there, the state actually gave us money for doing that zoning. And we've had that in the traffic calming account. Right. And we're using that to look at traffic calming throughout the downtown area. Well, okay. It's not a lot of money. Particularly of interest to this group, you did the same thing when you let the service station go in at the end of South Street. Right. And there's a little bit of traffic calming money there that's associated with a traffic calming request that we have that that's right. sadly has only been punctuated by someone getting hit two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. South Street is actually right on the radar for the traffic calming issues and we need mm -hmm. to figure it out. It's complicated. It's complicated. South Street is a complicated street because of the width of the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in some ways, I'd love to have it be a boulevard with nice plantings all the way down, but then nobody could do any left turns out of any of the streets, and you probably wouldn't like that. But, you know, it's the width of the street. You know, if we can do something about creating some ways to narrow the street to slow people down, it would probably be the best thing we could do. I'll take another few feet in the front yard. I mean, it, it's a beautiful street, but if there's a, you know, it, yeah. It has that, you know, people get on that street and they drive, they just drive too fast. And I'll, North King Street is pretty <coughs> fast too, and, I, and when I'm going home, people go too fast there. And I'll set my, I'll, I'll get the speed limit and I'll stay at it. And I got people behind me that are so mad, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I know that happens on South Street, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. State Street too. Twenty five, mm -hmm. you're supposed to go twenty five miles an hour on State Street. You're being your own pace car. I am being a pace car. Florence Road.